All right, this is AW and Hyperion coming at you, doing some uh, short theory reading again. Uh, this time we're reading Leon Trotsky's The ABC of Materialist Dialectics uh, from December 1939. Yeah. I mainly want to read this because, well, I've already read it, but uh, mainly this is uh, something that people recommend way too much, even though it's really, really bad. So it definitely needs to be taken down a couple notches uh, so people see just how stupid this is. And so that uh, you don't recommend it. If you ever have, uh, don't recommend it ever again. It's not dialectical. Are you here, Hyperion? Yeah, I'm here. All right, just oh, and sure. it should be noted, uh, this is like a, it says here, it's an extract from his, a petty bourgeois opposition in the Socialist Worker Party, Workers' Party. So this is just a part of a larger work that people take and, you know, recommend. All right, beginning. Dialectic is neither fiction nor mysticism, but a science of the forms of our thinking insofar as it is not limited to the daily problems of life, but attempts to arrive at an understanding of more complicated and drawn-out processes. The dialectic and formal logic bear relationships similar to that between higher and lower mathematics. I don't know about that, but I'm pretty sure that Trotsky didn't know either. So, uh, continuing, I will here attempt to sketch the substance of the problem in a very concrete form. The Aristotelian logic of the simple syllogism starts from the proposition that A is equal to A. This postulate is accepted as an axiom for a multitude of practical human actions and elementary generalizations. But in reality, A is not equal to A. This is easy to prove if we observe these two letters under a lens. They are quite different from each other. But one can object. The question is not of the size or of the form of the letters since they are only symbols for equal quantities, for instance, a pound of sugar. The objection is beside the point. In reality, a pound of sugar is never equal to a pound of sugar. A more delicate scale always discloses the difference. A difference. Again, one can object, but a pound of sugar is equal to itself. Neither is this true. All bodies change uninterruptedly in size, weight, color, etc. They are never equal to themselves. A sophist will respond that a pound of sugar is equal to itself at any given moment. Well, for <laughs> other people's are sophists, this was a whole bunch of fucking sophistry because none yeah, of this follows, yeah. by the way. You know, when he yeah. says, uh, but in reality, A is not equal to A and then goes on to talk about like the actual physical written letters on a fucking piece of paper. That's a non sequitur. That literally, yeah. it's illogical on formal logical ground and it's illogical on Hegelian logical grounds. Because A a is equal to A, you know, is just an abstract thing. It's just, it really is just symbols. You know, it's not about anything in, in specific. It could be about a pound of sugar. It could be about the letter A. It could be about your mom. It could be about Lenin. <laughs> so, you know, when he says, uh, so the, the example of the letter A is just plain stupid because nobody says that. You know, nobody's, when somebody says that, they're not talking about that. Even though that is something, by the way, that uh, a similar sort of argument is brought up by Fichte somewhere. I don't know where. I just, I have this memory like what? from oh, years ago. But the A equals A, you know, the first A in, is not the second A. Yeah, that was in. Uh, what's is it, it from the. Science of knowledge or whatever? Yeah. Science is it from knowledge? that first one we read? Yeah. Yeah, but he doesn't. He doesn't make this argument. He doesn't make this argument like about the physicality yeah. of it. He makes a, a logical argument about the, yeah, just the way we think about it. So there is a pretty yeah, good was, argument it, to be a made. A is a, yeah, yeah. I mean, we could get into that, but the A but is the, a thing yeah. is just a is, yeah. <laughs> So then he says, well, one can object the question is not of the size of the form of the letters since they are only symbols for equal quantities, for instance, a pound of sugar. Well, and then he says, 
in reality, a pound of sugar is never equal to a pound of sugar. Uh, I don't know what fucking reality he lives in, but uh, in my reality, you know, you, you put things on a scale, you can get a pound. And yeah. he says, well, you know, you can just, uh, the material identity is never the same. Uh, well, you know, when we're talking about a pound, we're not talking about an exact identity either. We're talking about a general, conceptually abstracted identity. You know, a pound is a range of things, you know, whatever the scale says a pound is. So, you know, whatever in the, in the scale reaches that, that's a pound. It doesn't matter if a couple atoms are here or there. It, it It's within the boundary. That's exactly what a pound is. Yeah. And uh, the note says uh, something being to itself, equal to itself, I assume, uh, means that despite quantitative change, it still remains what it is. That is to say, there is no qualitative change. It is, quote-unquote, self-identical in... Hegelian terminology means something totally lacking in internal contradictions and vitality. But that just doesn't make sense for this situation. Yeah, because what he's talking he's about really is qualities. And in qualities, yeah. indeed, it doesn't change. You know, the identity is, if a thing is fucking orange, I'm sorry, it's orange. And you say, well, it's not the same shade of orange. That's not the question. Yeah. You know, quality qualities have a huge range depending on, you know, what you're talking about. You know, the quality of a dog can look like a a chihuahua and a schnauzer or a doberman uh, it's still a dog the quality is identical yeah, yeah the, in that the, abstract sense the pound is qualitatively the same because it's the same it's the same amount measure. yeah it's yeah. the same measure it's the same color i mean it could change if it's if water is added to it or something but that that means it's no longer just a pound of sugar so, a pound of sugar is a pound of sugar. Yeah, and then the, he goes on, well, you know, they are never equal to themselves, you know, because even if even if it is the same thing, you know, you wait, you take a pound of sugar and you say, okay, this is a pound, and you weigh it again, and he says, well, it's not, even if you didn't move it. Because in that time, you know, some physical process has gone on, you know, a electron here or there has been, like, taken off. You know, some radiation has occurred, you know, blah, blah, blah. Something has been changed. Therefore, not even the thing is identical to itself, you know, over time. Well, okay, you know, that's a, a pedantic, stupid point. So, you know, it's inconsequential to the whole problem. But, you know, even if you give it to him, you know, then he says, well, you can say it's identical to itself at any given moment. And he says, well, that's a sophistic thing. No, that's exactly what it means. The thing is equal to itself at any given moment. You know that that apple is that apple. You know, it, it it's it doesn't turn to a cat the next second. Yeah. You know, unless you're a magician, in which case, you know, uh, <laughs> teach me. So yeah, this guy would have been Trotsky would have been uh, difficult to bake a cake with. All right, <laughs> let's, let's go on to the next. Yeah, yeah. Second. Major point of that paragraph, though. Uh, the 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 identity talked about here is qualitative identity. It's not it's not a quantitative or blah 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 thing. I mean, it's just a thing is what it is, uh, and that's it. Uh, there's there's nothing deeply esoteric about this. It's not very hard to understand. I mean, all his examples are just inconsequential. They don't break anything. You know, it doesn't break through uh, the formal logic here. Or anybody would just say, "Well, you're stupid." Yeah. You can say A is not equal to A as in A is not the perception you have of that. Maybe it has some element you don't recognize, but yeah, A equals A, it is what it is. You know, even Hegel isn't uh, going to deny that, you know, there is yeah. a moment in which A is indeed itself. So, continuing. Aside from the extremely dubious practical value of this axiom, it does not withstand theoretical criticism either. How should we really conceive the word moment? If it is an infinitesimal interval of time, then a pound of sugar is subjected during the course of that moment to inevitable changes. Or is the moment a purely mathematical abstraction, that is, a zero of time? But everything is... Time is a consequently... After uh, but everything exists in time. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, it's still my recording because it records my mic locally. Oh. 
Uh, but everything exists in time, and existence itself is an uninterrupted process of transformation. Time is, consequently, a fundamental element of existence. Thus, the axiom A is equal to A signifies that a thing is equal to itself it is, if it does not change, that is, if it does not exist. Uh, another non sequitur point. You know, A is equal to it to itself if it does not change. Well, yeah, that's exactly the point. If the quality does not change, if it's still an apple, it's still an apple, buddy. Doesn't matter if it got a you know a few atoms changed. It is qualitatively what it is. And the point about moment, uh, obviously, uh, you can tell he never <laughs> he never read Hegel because uh, Hegel goes, well, yeah, moment's just an abstraction. Moment doesn't have a time. It doesn't really, you know, it's a logical moment. It's just an abstraction of uh, conceptual elements. So nothing to do with Hegelian dialectics, nothing to do with Marxist dialectics. Uh, nothing to do with logic either, or, or formal the, logic. If it does not exist, I'm not getting that. Uh, well, so he says since everything exists in time, and you know, time yeah. inexorably means change, therefore, you know, anything yeah. that exists in time has to change, so it's never equal to itself. But you know, oh, uh, because if it doesn't change, it doesn't exist. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense, I guess. I mean, abstractly. <laughs> Damn, I, I mean, guess. yeah, it makes sense abstractly. Apparently, the present as a moment doesn't exist for Trotsky. Ah. Or, you know, he can't freeze the past and he can't freeze the future and talk about that. Apparently, we can't talk about those things, you know. Things are always moving. Uh, which, you know, by the way, reflects quite well on the character of Trotsky because he was a snake. He was always slithering from one position to the next. You know, they say your idea, your ideas reflect who you are and your interests. Like, seriously, if you don't know about Trotsky, uh, go read about, like, his history with Lenin. Uh, Trotsky was a shifty, shifty snake. So, continuing. At first glance, it could be it could seem that these subtleties are useless. Well, I I would say they indeed are. Uh, they don't seem they a, are. You just don't get it yet. Let him explain. In reality, they are of decisive significance. The axiom A is equal to A appears on the one hand to be the point of departure for all our knowledge, and on the other hand, the point of departure for all the errors in our knowledge. To make use of the axiom of A is equal to A with impunity is possible only within certain limits. When quantitative changes in A are negligible to the task at hand, then we can presume that A is equal to A. This is, for example, the manner in which a buyer and a seller consider a pound of sugar. We consider the temperature of the sum likewise. Until recently, we considered the buying power of the dollar in the same way. But quantitative changes beyond a certain limit, beyond certain limits, become converted into qualitative. A pound of sugar subjected to the action of water or kerosene ceases to be a pound of sugar. A dollar in the embrace of a president ceases to be a dollar. What? What? <laughs> George uh, Bush held a dollar. It is no longer a dollar. <laughs> it, it's no longer a dollar. It's uh, That dollar is now worth $200 because the president touched it. Probably. I don't know if that's the point he's making or what, but... Maybe this is a Might be a translation error. Uh, to determine at the right moment the critical point where quantity changes into quality is one of the most important and difficult tasks in all the spheres of knowledge, including sociology. Uh, so here he turns it around, and you know, while he says, "Look, you know, we can't," you know, it's a, one of the worst things to assume. It's dangerous. He then goes ahead and says, "Look, we got to assume it." Because, yeah, you know, practically a pound of sugar is a fucking pound of sugar. You know, you got to make yeah, uh, quite a bit of changes. You know, he he doesn't even talk about here about a quality or a quant about quantitative change of the same thing into another quality. No, I mean, he literally talks about you pour some water or some kerosene on sugar. Obviously, Trotsky, it's, it's not like this genius Magic revelation magic. that only you could figure out that now a pound of water and sugar is not just a pound of sugar. I mean, I... This is like that joke. Uh, what's like, heavier, this is... a pound of water or a pound of sugar? <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> like, uh, I don't know why 
certain people seem to think this is like some real deep shit. It's stupid. Like it's stupid. Anybody would go and said, obviously, you know, what, what's significant about that? You know, he could have made a more significant uh, point talking about, look, if you just keep piling on fucking sugar, eventually, uh, you know, a mountain of sugar is uh, is different. Or, you know, he could have just, like, talked about the narrow margins of, you know, well, uh, you know, a pound is a pound within these certain limits. And you you add, like, you know, the camel, you know, it's like the the straw that breaks the camel's back. Yeah. You know, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. And then you suddenly add, you know, just an imperceptible bit more and it suddenly breaks the camel's back. Yeah, he could have made a revolutionary point like that. I don't know. Yeah, you know, but, yeah. but but even obvious. then, even then, like it has nothing to do with dialectics. I mean, that's just obvious. Things keep getting, yeah, you know, a little bit, a little bit worse. You know, a little bit and a little bit worse, and suddenly, you know, one point it just gets to a breaking point. Yeah, which is, by the way, you know, kind of one of like the points Hegel makes about this. Yeah, you know, eventually there is just a qualitative change uh, that emerges. You know, unforeseen or maybe foreseen. You know. But either way, I mean, it, it doesn't break the law of identity. You know, as a matter of fact, the fact that you notice there is a change is because of the law of identity. Mm-hmm. You know, the fact you can tell that this is a new quality is precise because you knew the identity of a prior quality. How about that one? For a guy who says he he doesn't use formal logic, uh, he sure needs it. Yeah. Maybe he just picks and chooses. <laughs> to use formal logic and not. Sorry, Josh requested an ice pick joke. All right, so continuing. Well, I mean, another point. I don't know what the hell is with Marxists and like their, their obsession with the quality and quantity dialectic. It's not that impressive, guys. I mean, uh, it, it really isn't. Uh, this is just. This has been common sense now for at least a century. Uh, maybe it wasn't, you know, I don't know about history very much, you know, maybe at common the time, sense, uh, yeah, maybe at the mean. time, like, it really wasn't common sense, you know, I can believe, you know, there was some point in which people just couldn't cognize yeah. this, even though it seems obvious, but, you know, it certainly is common sense within the last century, you know, people aren't like, yeah, if you just keep adding to it, it's going to change. Yeah, I, I know people uh, today are like, well, Aristotle made some observations that seem obvious to us, but Back then, it wasn't obvious, you know. Uh, I heard someone once say, one of my professors said uh, that everyone now is about as smart as Aristotle was then, which I don't... <laughs> Not even close. At all. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, I think his point was, like, his observations are things that normal people observe today. And most people yeah. back then have to, you know, they, they had to focus on their situations rather than, like, observing uh, things about like common things about science and objects and things like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean like uh, so yeah, the thing the thing is stuff. the thing is like uh, it, it really it seems obvious especially when you have to find like you really do have identities. Like you know exactly what a pound of sugar is. Uh like the, the only time like this is actually questionable is in the how much is a bunch question. You know, when do you have just a little pile of sugar and when do you have a bunch of sugar? You know, at what point does it become, you know, a bunch? You know, what's that called? That is a, that is considered a qualitative transformation of just vagueness. And the reason, you know, this is of any interest is... Uh, you cut out? Uh, well, we were talking about the, the whole measure of, you know, like when is it a bunch of sugar or just a little... Uh, point is, that's the only time, like, you know, we really have this question of, you know, is there a qualitative or quantitative change? Is there a quantitative change or not? Otherwise, it's pretty obvious. And it's Some sugar and a bunch of sugar. That's not you can grasp this analytically perfectly well. So, you know, uh, anyways, yeah, that's that was my point. I don't get what, what the obsession is with uh, quality and quantity. Like, it's not amazing at all. 
it's it's not something only Hegel gets these days. You know, plenty of analytics can very well think this and uh, do fine with it. You're a fucking idiot. Uh, if you guys have seen uh, ever encountered Rosa Lichtenstein, uh, that's one of her big points, and it's a true point, by the way. In that, oh, not her. I, it's a it's a guy, isn't it? Who? Uh, Rosa Lichtenstein. Rosa? Oh, I have no idea of their gender identity. <laughs> and uh, even though, like, oh, Rosa's pretty, pretty much seems incapable, literally, like thinking what anyone else says no matter how well you explain it and she does have a point about like harping on uh, especially about this or you know proving that obviously you know you can think quality and quantity change is analytically fine but anyways let's continue Every worker knows that it is impossible to make two completely equal objects in the elaboration of bearing brass into cone bearings a certain deviation is allowed for the, cone, the cones, which should not, however, go beyond certain limits. This is called tolerance. By observing the norms of tolerance, the cones are considered as being equal. A is equal to A. When the tolerance is exceeded, the quantity goes over into quality. In other words, the cone bearings can become inferior or completely worthless. Once again, it doesn't disprove the point he was even beginning to he made originally. I mean, he's here talking about the very things we mentioned, which is the whole point is that quality has a range of quality, you know, in which things are that quality, just a little bit less or more, but still that quality. So, you know, the, the identity of quality remains fine. You know, it works. Nothing broken. What he seems to have is he seems to think that quality either doesn't really exist or quality is reducible to a image an exact material arrangement which is not true you know the quality of roughness is can be instantiated in various material arrangements and it's still rough you know the color of orange has a certain ranges from light orange to dark orange it's still orange mm -hmm. you know an apple is still an apple whether it's rotten small red yellow green sour sweet whatever so uh no problem. Uh, you know, he's he's railing against something that uh, no one in the philosophical community at his time believed, and uh, no one I've ever known about actually believes. So continuing, our scientific thinking is only a part of our general practice, including techniques. For concepts, there are all there also exists tolerance, which is established not by formal logic issuing from the action A equal is equal to A but by the dialectical logic issuing from the axiom, axiom that everything is always changing. Common sense is characterized by the fact that it systematically exceeds dialectical tolerance. Does it? Uh, or is it? No, I mean, he's wrong <laughs> here. I mean, like, the whole, the whole issue of tolerance is that the range is defined. Guess what defines? It's not dialectical logic. What defines is actually something that in, uh, at least German idealism is called uh, the mode of understanding, which is, guess what? The mode of thinking which splits things, defines things as specific. The reason you know there's a tolerance, the reason you know there is even a change is because you actually have specific differences. Yeah. So, you know, you need A to be A to know when it is not A. You know, uh, not an obvious thing, by the way. Uh, definitely, most people would be like, "What? What? what you, why do you have to say that?" You know, it seems uh, it seems obvious and not obvious at the same time. But it's a Hegelian point. You know, to know what is not being, you got to know what being is, buddy. To know what is yeah. nothing, you got to know what nothing is. They really are split. They really are different. They really are defined. You know, if everything was just like this smooshy goop of, of conceptual, like, uh, in concept and in being, you could never have things that really are anything. Because there's no differentiation. 
doesn't exist at all, which is ex which is what is implied by all of this, by the way. His whole thing is like, oh, your A is never equal to A. He's saying identity doesn't exist. But then if identity doesn't exist, difference can't exist because there's no identity to compare it to. You know, there's no, there's no A to say, well, then it is now not A. You know, there's no apple to say, well, now it's not an apple. You know, if you don't have the identity of the apple, you can't say, well, now that the apple has gone through my digestive tract and come out of my bum as excrement, it's not an apple. You know, Trotsky would say, well, yeah, you know, it is and it is not an apple. Which, you know, there's a way in which to make sense of that, you know, dialectically. <laughs> yes. But sure. normally it's, it's stupid. You know, you have to assume there actually is a difference in order to even say that there is a unity in identity as well. basic point, the, the real dialectical point would be here that Trotsky just doesn't fucking understand it, uh, that identity is difference. Can't have one without the other. They are each other. To be different is to have your own separate identity. To have your own separate identity is, guess what, to be different. Ho ho. Continuing. Vulgar thought. So I, I love when they use this. Vulgar. Vulgar thought operates with such concepts as capitalism, morals, freedom, worker, state, etc. as fixed abstractions, presuming that capitalism is equal to capitalism. <laughs> uh, morals are equal to morals, etc. Dialectical thinking analyzes all things and phenomena in their continuous change, while determining the material conditions of those changes, the critical limit beyond which A ceases to be A. A worker state ceases to be a worker state. Uh, capitalism is communism, guys. You heard it here, Leon Trotsky. It's also feudalism, and uh, morals are shoes. <laughs> I mean, like these are really stupid. Uh, you know, I, I don't know how he thought these were very bright. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what he's... I'm trying to make sense of his point here. Like maybe he's saying one stage of common of capitalism is not equal to the to a different stage, like how we have uh, higher production than we used to, but it's okay. still capitalism. I mean, uh, that's how I'm reading it, but I don't know. No, no. The fundamental point he's trying to get, and I get this, is he's really against this. Idea, he's really trying to combat the idea of of things like being eternal and static. Yeah, you know, the idea that but if we have capitalism. Uh, yeah, and as abstractions, but abstractions specifically in the eternal sense. That mm -hmm. uh, he seems to mistake that if you can define capitalism as an eternal concept, that somehow that defines real capitalism as eternal itself. Yeah, which is not think, the yeah, case yeah, at all, by the definitely way. Definitely not true. But yeah, I think we can take a better point than he's trying to make out of this. That yeah, capitalism is not capitalism in that this instance of capitalism is different than the instance of capitalism 100 years ago. It, it is a fixed thing, but it's abstract to say capitalism and not know the specific version of capitalism you're talking about, I guess. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely uh, a, a charitable reading, which I think he does yeah. intend, you know, I think he does intend to, to get that across, but he does it badly. And also, you know, the point I was saying... Uh, he's also very much against this idea that, you know, that if things are fixed in concept, you know, there's an assumption apparently that they are also fixed in reality. Mm -hmm. You know, such as the idea that uh, capitalism is just human nature, you know, it's fundamental, eternal to us, you know, and therefore, you know, uh, classical economists and even modern economists, you know, go and extrapolate, you know, capitalism into the very depths of, you know, the beginning of human society, you know, which is, I see there capitalism was. You know, the very first time, he, you know, some Neanderthal, like, picked the fucking uh, fruit from a tree, and another one picked, you know, a berry, and they looked at each other and said, mm, I'd rather pick, have the berry than this fruit, and they exchanged, there you had capitalism. <laughs> you know, obviously that's wrong, and, you know, yeah. in that sense, you know, Trotsky's right, you know, he's, he's got a good point, but he's putting his points forward in a really, really pedantic and stupid way, which is very unsophisticated, and is very all over the place, you know, it's just a... Uh, it's like Mao, you know, when we're reading Mao's on contradiction, he has he had a good point. And, you know, the fundamental point of the paper, of the essay, I think, was good. 
you know, it's a true point and people should take it into account. But the problem is they're putting this point, which would be, you know, very basic, very straightforward, in this weird metaphysical uh, style when it doesn't have to be. Yeah, it just needless, needlessly complicates it. The morals equal to morals. Uh, yeah, we can say, like, you, you're not a moral person. Someone recently, I don't want to name names, said I was an immoral person for my opinion about something. And I was like, well, that's not, you know, an absolute moral. I mean, I thought that I didn't tell him that, but... Yeah, he's definitely talking about uh, the change of morals, you know. This is a this comes from Marx, you know, where Marx says, you know, morals aren't eternal, you know. Our morals yeah. change, and clearly they have changed across time, you know. S different societies have different uh, morals to a certain extent. So, you know, the assumption is, well, morals uh, aren't universal or eternal. So, anyway, in that sense, you know, I know what he's trying to say, I mean, but in the way he says it, it can be so easily misconstrued that you know it i don't know it seems to me like not to be worth saying it in the way he says it yeah so things change that's the point yeah things change uh, materially obviously uh, conceptually yeah. occasionally occasionally yeah uh th you know the this idea that uh, if the concept is set the reality is set is a wrong one because you can have the concept set without the reality being set by it. You know, things will move out of certain structural forms, you know, concepts, mm -hmm. and just, you know, shift because history is materially shifting. Ideas are also shifting, you know, along with the material basis. Yeah. Things and also, I and also ideas like shift within the ideal ba the ideal superstructure, which also then change the material base as well. So you know, sure. there's a there's change in both sides, but there's also a a long lasting structure there. You know, you, you know, uh, it'd be weird if Trotsky went ahead and says, "Well, nature isn't nature." Uh, I'm pretty sure he wouldn't say that, because, but that's, you know, where he's going with this kind of logic. Or matter isn't matter. Oh, you think it's a slippery slope? Well, yeah, I mean, like, <laughs> I mean, he, I'm pretty yeah. sure he, he, I'm pretty sure he's the kind of guy who would say, look, it's all about, it's all material. Well, according to your own logic, matter oh, yeah. isn't matter. Yeah, and then he would, I don't know, I think when he, he got to that point and he, he would realize that he was wrong, but maybe not, who knows. Okay, let's go on to the next one. So the fundamental flaw of vulgar thought lies in the fact that it wishes to content itself with motionless imprints of a reality which consists of eternal motion. Dialectical thinking gives to concepts by means of closer approximations, corrections, concretization, a richness of content and flexibility. I would even say a succulence, which to a certain extent brings them closer to living phenomena. No cap not capitalism in general, but a given capitalism at a given stage of development. Not a worker state in general, but a given worker state in a backward country, an imperialist encirclement, etc. So, I yeah, mean, that's here, what, what I yeah, that, yeah, that's where we're getting at. You know, that's really what he wants to say, which is, by the way, um, also what Mao says in contradi uh, on contradiction. Uh, you know, these two points are a good point, I think. Uh, it's basically what I call a principle of contextualism uh, or pragmatism in which you must take the real context of things you know, if you're if you're going to be doing a concrete practice of any kind, uh, but here's where he's mistaking this with dialectics. Uh, this has nothing to do with dialectics, because you can do this perfectly well analytically. Uh, there's nothing about analytic thinking, formal thinking, formal logic, which will stop you from doing this kind of thinking in which you can contextualize things and see how they relate and how they work. Nothing wrong with it. I mean, uh, we have analytical Marxists. What is that? Uh, G.A. Cohen, I think. Um, I read a bit of his stuff, uh, a couple, uh, a short essay of his. Uh, pretty good, in my opinion. Works just fine with explaining change. Doesn't need dialectics. And, you know, that's kind of G.A. Cohen's point. You don't need dialectics for most of this. Doesn't make sense. You know, so so having a principle of contextualism is is nothing dialectical. You know, it's just good, yeah. common, rational sense. 
yeah, this is just a thing on the left, I guess, in general, that, like, if someone says, you're not being dialectical, it means you're you're not doing it right, or whatever. No, it's not true, really. Yeah, so, um, I mean, uh, just, just to give an example, um, the difference here is that th these are contingent. If we were we were to even call these dialectics, we'd have to call them contingent, uh, arbitrary, or chance dialectics. You know, they they don't really have any central contradiction. You know, the world is messy. Uh, the world is full of irrational elements. You know, literally the, the experience of things themselves is irrational. You know, there is no there is no concept of red, for example. You know, it's something you know that's beyond thought uh, as an experience. You know, it's not a, a conceptual structure in your head or anything you know it's a, it's a natural experience uh, you know the way the world is also set up you know that uh, you know we are around this sun uh, you know that we took this much time to evolve that we had this exact uh, material history of you know maybe this all you know was caused by the butterfly effect and you know some black hole you know god knows how far away <laughs> tens of billions of light years away or whatever and, you know, and that little gravitational wave is what caused the whole chain to develop all the, you know, life and blah, blah, blah. It, that's something about contextual material history, but it has nothing to do with conceptual dialectical logic. You know, you can make a necessary chain of, you know, the physical facts, and you'll have an endless chain at that, you know. Seemingly, there's, there's no reason to think that there would be a limit. But with dialectics, there is a limit, you know, you, you abstract things. You know, the problem with material dialectics, as uh, Trotsky is actually putting forth, is that you don't have an actual clear demarcation of where to stop. Because you can just as easily go and say that, you know, uh, this such thing was caused by literally, like, uh, an explosion on the sun, you know, 500 years ago, you know, caused uh, Donald Trump to go absolutely bonkers. And, you know, hit the nuclear red switch. Or you could uh, blame that on, you know, it was his mom, you know, he's Oedipus complex or whatever. <laughs> Some repressed uh, childhood trauma, you know, little man syndrome. You can choose any arbitrary thing you want and have a completely valid, uh, formally logical chain of material causes uh, in any way you like. But there is no clear demarcation of where you stop, you know, making this explanation. You know, why do you? Why stop at psychological phenomena? Why not reduce the psychological phenomena to material phenomena? Why not reduce that, you know, to quantum physics? You know, why stop at the history of, you know, just humans? Why not go to microbacteria? Why not go to the history of the Earth? Why not go to the history of the solar system? And then the history of the universe and say it was all caused by 23-dimensional vibrating strings. Uh, there, There's no demarcation there to stop ever so you know you don't get actual closed necessary connections which is exactly what dialectical thinking is meant to do it's supposed to get absolute necessary connections such that you know exactly what thing you're talking about what really defines the limits of where you're no longer talking about it and how that really necessarily develops from the ways it actually is Logically speaking, essentially. So, uh, I don't know. Uh, let me know if that made sense. If not, uh, you know, ask in the questions and uh, I will elaborate on that. <laughs> you still here, Hyperion? Yeah. Uh, did I, was I more or less clear on that? Were you coherent? Yeah. I mean, I understand what you're talking about, but yeah. All right, continuing. Dialectical thinking is related to vulgar in the same way that a motion picture is related to a still photograph. The motion picture does not outlaw the still photograph, but combines a series of them according to the laws of motion. Uh, for a guy who denies the law of identity, here he's talking about the still photograph of identical, you know, moments, literally. I mean, so literally, this is this is Trotsky literally contradicting himself from where he began. 
you know, uh, not in a small, minor way. Like, this is just a complete reversal. Dialectics in action, ladies and gentlemen. Dialectics in action. You know, when you're really thinking, and you're thinking rightly, you'll find yourself doing this. Uh, you'll find that you contradict yourself because you have to. You know, the, the truth comes out wh whichever way you spin it if you think right. So, continuing, dialectics does not deny the syllogism, but teaches us to combine syllogism in such a way as to bring our understanding closer to the eternally changing reality. Hegel and his logic established a series of laws, change of quality into quality, development through contradictions, conflict of content and form, interruption and continu continuity, change of possibility into inevitability, etc., which are just as important for theoretical thought as the simple syllogism for mere elementary tasks. So, first off, that is completely false. Hegel never establishes a single law of dialectics in the logic. Source, read the fucking logic. Uh, this first part, of course, is reminiscent of Walter Benjamin's uh, idea of the dialectical image in the Arcades Project. But even there, like, he lacked any sort of way to conceptualize a significant statement about what he was trying to say. Who, Trotsky? No, uh, Benjamin. I mean, I think Trotsky oh. here, too, but... Well, no, with, with Benjamin, I think if you know what dialectics is, uh, the yeah. way he talks about it, it makes sense. I get what, yeah, I just I get what he's talking about, but I don't get a yeah, definite picture yeah. of what he's talking about. Yeah, and there's no, like, he doesn't have any way to to apply it. Although, I mean, when we discussed it, uh, I, I, did, I think I got at least one interpretation that seems to make sense of it. Mm -hmm. But anyways, here, uh, you know, Trotsky is getting more concrete, although he's wrong, one, on the laws of, of, of dialectics. There are no such laws. And he's wrong on, two, that these are approximations. Uh, logical dialectics are not approximations at all. They are certainties. They are ab they are absolute certainties, you know, and this is part of Hegel's project. Hegel wants absolute knowledge. He doesn't want approximations. That's exactly what he wants to get away from. You know, we've had nothing but approximations in the history of philosophy and the history of science. You know, when what we want in real science is not an approximation. What we want is the truth. Yeah. So you the know, revealed reality. So you know, Hegel doesn't want contingent. Maybe it is, you know, maybe it, it kind of is, but it's really not. You know, we're not sure. He wants, we are definitely sure, you know, it is certainly this way. Uh, you know, uh, Trotsky here appeals to dialectics in motion. And once again, uh, notice that he contradicted himself. You know, at first he says, you know, we don't have moments of identity. Things are always moving. But here his contradiction is you have to have the picture to have the motion picture. The picture has to be real. You know, it, it really has, you really have to have that moment in film. Otherwise, you couldn't have a motion picture. Yeah. So, you know, you have to have that moment in which A is indeed A. And he says, dialectics does not deny the syllogism. Absolutely true. But teaches us to combine syllogism in such a way as to bring our understanding closer to the eternally changing reality. Um, I don't know about the combination of syllogisms, but certainly the syllogisms move and combine moments. So, you know, he's not too far off, but at the same time, uh, you know, I'm not quite, I don't quite think he knows exactly how, you know, correct what he's saying really is. Uh, but once the, but the important thing, he doesn't explain why this motion is really happening. Uh, he's saying, you know, it's happening, this motion is happening, we have a motion film, it's moving, you know, it's contradictions, but why? You know, there is no explanation as why you have to think about it this way, because as I said earlier, you can think all of this very well with just normal thinking. You don't have to think it uh, in a Hegelian way at all. So, definitely lacking. Um, continuing. Hegel wrote before Darwin and before Marx, thanks to the powerful impulse given to thought by the French Revolution, Hegel anticipated the general movement of science, but because it was only an anticipation, although by a genius, it received from Hegel an idealistic character. 
Hegel operated with ideological shadows as the ultimate reality. Marx demonstrated that the movement of these ideological shadows reflected nothing but the movement of material bodies. Um, you know, uh, somehow they, you know, they always have to give you know their props to Hegel, but at the same time they got to give him a kick too. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's I don't know. It's a Marxist thing, you know. Marx could never accept that you know uh, Hegel got some things completely right, and you know deserved it that way you know he he did give him the props but he always had to give a little kick uh, and in this case you know when he says uh, because Hegel you know couldn't uh, get to the real concrete matters uh, he gave him ideals to character no um, I mean I don't know how much I should go into this uh, I really don't like when people say this because it's yeah. it's so it's misunderstood uh, look idea idealism in Hegel really if you really can't be asked to learn about it, at least know this one thing. It means abstraction. And all abstraction means is to take something away from its whole. You know, to remove it from a whole. That is all idealism means. So if you have definite boundaries, you have abstraction. If you have that in thought you have an abstraction in thought if you have then in reality you have an abstraction in reality and Hegel's whole point about idealism is you got to have abstraction if you didn't you could never have had difference in the first place things have to be abstracted otherwise you never could have thought difference in thought and you can't have difference in material reality in nature nature yeah. would be just this undifferentiated blob of nothing because there would be nothing to differentiate from. In order to be differentiated, it would have to abstract itself. A cat is abstraction. Why? Because it moves. You know, it is an independent thing to a certain extent. So things are abstracted. Things are ideal in that sense, always, even if they are made of matter. Uh, that's Hegel's idealism. You know, the fact that yeah. things can be independent to an extent is to the extent that they are ideal. And you need a, you need it. You need abstraction. You know this uh, concretion that Marxists are obsessed with is nothing but the concretion of abstraction. You need concrete abstraction, not just concretion as a just saying, look, everything is interconnected. You know, in in reality, the whole you know everything is one united solid whole. It's not good enough. You'd have to ex you can't explain from that why there is difference. You need abstraction to get it going. So, you know, these ideolo ideological shadows, uh, you know, you could say there are shadows in, in that, you know, Hegel didn't develop them enough, didn't abstract them enough, actually. But you can't just blame that on, oh, well, that's it's because it was idealism. No, um, it will be idealism, doesn't matter how concrete you get. As a matter of fact, the more concrete you get, the more ideal, the more ideas you're relating, you know, the more moments you're bringing together, the more you realize the whole is in parts you know it has to be in parts so you know Marx's capital fantastic work of abstraction uh, when it isn't uh, it's just blending back into the morass of contingent history and just saying well you know this is how it happened but you know as I said earlier that leads you into a problem of like where do you cut where do you where do you call the line you know at what point can we stop saying well you know this was the real cause. Because you can go out and say dogmatically and say, well, it was all, in the end, you know, it is all the material relations, you know, it's all the base determining the superstructure. And then a Freudian can come against and say, well, come on, you're ignoring the psychological, you know, structure of the mind, you know, you're the repressive apparatus, the id, the, you know, the id, the ego, and the superego, you know, the sexual tensions, all these things, you know, which just naturally happen in society, it has nothing to do with economics. You know, as a matter of fact, uh, you know, Freud would probably, in the civilization is discontent, probably goes ahead and just read society off completely from the abstraction of that determination of, you know, the psychological structure of the mind. So, you know, when, when you don't make certain absolute abstractions, you run into the problem of you can't prove that your abstraction is the abstraction. 
which is exactly what Hegel's logic is meant to provide an answer to. So you know when you so uh, if you want to definitely cut off questions of you know how do you know that you know it really is what it is you know the cause really is this cause uh, you do some good old Hegelian dialectics you, know, you don't do this you know just contingent causal chain uh, and once again just another point uh, Marx wasn't a materialist in the sense of material bodies people people bring that up often I don't know why uh, because uh, from all that I read of Marx and all that I read about Marx, Marx didn't give a fuck about materialism in that sense. He didn't care about physical bodies. Doesn't matter. You know, metaphysics. It's metaphysics, you know. For a bunch of guys who hate metaphysics, you, you sure love metaphysics. All right, continuing. Still here, Hyperion? Yeah, I'm here. I thought it was a good uh, rant. Continuing, we call our dialectic a materialist, since it roots its roots are neither in heaven nor in the depths of our free will, but in objective reality in nature. Consciousness grew out of the unconscious, psychology out of physiology, the organic world out of the inorganic, the solar system out of the nebulae. On all the rungs of this ladder of development, the quantitative changes were transformed to qualitative. Our thought, including dialectical thought, is only one of the forms of the expression of changing matter. There is place within the system for neither God nor devil nor immortal soul, soul nor eternal norms of laws and morals. The dialectic of thinking, having grown out of the dialectic of nature, possesses consequently a thoroughly materialist character. So, uh, by the way, uh, Hegel thinks this too. <laughs> Just look at the philosophy of nature, hello. Uh, why do you think it comes before the philosophy of spirit, which is, by the way, the philosophy of the psyche and then the philosophy of uh, society which is the philosophy of objective spirit you know this this privileging of matter as the absolute is weird because you know there's no explanation to matter itself in any of this so it's just an automatic assumption it's an assertion uh, and once again, this appeal to dialectical thinking as just being change. You know, that dialectic is just change, you know. Um, you know, we can just go back to Heraclitus and uh, just say, you know, we're Heraclitians. Why why call this dialectics? Uh, you know, seems to me just to be stupid. And, uh, I mean, basically since uh, obviously Trotsky thinks that this has nothing to do with concept and necessity, rather simply has to do with the contingent necessities of physics and matter, um... You know, modern physicists would totally agree. You know, there's plenty of physical determinists nowadays. As a matter of fact, it's the dominant paradigm. Plenty of people just want to say, look, it's all just physics, man. It's all just physics. It's no different from other people who says it's just the genes. You know, we're just machines, pie, you know, doing the bidding of genes. You know, just easily you could say we're just machines doing the bidding of material laws of physics. Which, you know, if Trotsky is peddling this, you know, he, he can't deny it. Because in order to deny it, he'd have to just make this arbitrary stop and say, well, look, you know, except, you know, for this and this and that. Continuing, Darwinism, which explained the evolution of species through quantitative transformations passing to qualitative, was the highest triumph of the dialectic in a whole field of organic matter. Another great triumph was the discovery of the table of atomic weights of chemical elements and further transformation of one element into another. So, uh, once again, you know, Darwin wasn't uh, making this on any dialectical logic. He was just did it on good old common sense. He saw, well, you know, <laughs> shit changes, man. Uh, and he could see it. You know, the reason he came up with the whole slow change is uh, the islands he visited, uh, where was it? Somewhere in close to South America uh, he, he saw finches and he noticed that like you know there were various finches of the say you know with various different uh, levels of development in their beaks and uh, you know their styles so he kind of surmised well look uh, must be like one same species which is changing over time you know and how did he, how was this uh, change made well natural selection you know the ones that succeeded uh, mm -hmm. made it through uh, 
Are you talking completely about analytic. Yeah, Galapagos. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I didn't know if it was the same as the other one. Yeah, you know, and so he saw this. He didn't make it on any dialectical jump. He, he made it with good old analytical logic, formal logic. It's obvious, you know. A, B, C, you know, he makes this external connection, obviously. He hadn't seen it for himself, the complete transformation with his own eyes, but he sees yeah. enough to make, you know, a logical inductive leap, which is pretty solid. And he goes ahead and makes it. Why? Because he can. It makes sense. You know, he notices change precise because there is identity. Which, by the way, Hegel denied evolution. Uh, didn't make sense to him, but at his time, obviously, you know, as Trotsky said, there, Darwin wasn't around. Nobody had a good explanation yeah. for evolution. Uh, if Darwin, you know, had come, uh, Hegel probably would have initially not accepted it, but, you know, within a couple of years, he would have bent. Yeah. Yeah, when there's some new change that, I mean, new theory that uh, changes the very way you think about life, of course, you're, you're going to be apprehensive to it at first. But I think it would have come around to see evolution makes yeah. sense. Yeah, and uh, by the way, I mean, uh, you know, Trotsky is at least, Trotsky and Marxists are at least right in one sense in that there is a necessity in a lot of Hegel's like post logic science of logic structures which necessitate an addition of real empirical correlates uh, to fill in what the pure abstract idea cannot because in the idea you can see some logical movements but to bring it down to earth, you got to get those logical movements through a material movement as well manifest. So, you know, the dialectic of life won't be understood completely unless you have uh, the dialect, the material movement of development of evolution, you know, such that you can explain how this dialectic manifests in, in matter. So there, there is an abstraction to Hegel's stuff which lacks the material uh, connection to our world you know there are and because of this it seems jumpy you know you see this in the philosophy of nature you see this in the philosophy of history where you know he can outline the abstract structures of societies but not the movement of one society to another uh, in which case, you know, the addition of class struggle, the addition of the technical developments of technology, you know, developments of technology are absolutely necessary. And without them, you know, you, you get these, you know, pretty hard jumps from one to the next. But if you added those links, the more solid the, the, the empirical links, the more solid the logic will even be. So, you know, um, there is a need to, you know, to critique uh, abstraction, and we need to get more concrete. But this concretion is not just about bad road motion. Uh, this concretion is about the way things happen as the way things happen at a certain level. You know, we really need to see the history of how societies really changed. And from that, start seeing the real movement, not just in ideas, uh, which, by the way, Hegel himself doesn't properly uh, articulate. He doesn't properly articulate the movements of culture. You know, mostly because, well, for or for a lot of our history, we don't have a very good record. So for a lot of that, you know, we're, we're stuck with speculations and, you know, if we were honest, we just have just, yeah, this abstract jumpy structure because that's all we can legitimately say. Yeah. But for a lot more uh, recent stuff, you know, starting with like, uh, you know, Greece, Rome, medieval times we have a lot more history to show you know the real how movements started going how ideas shifted how material developments were shifting and if you injected that into hegel's logic not not injected externally but you know just brought it in as a content form which is necessary uh, you'd get a fantastic a fantastic necessary overview about how the necessary logical structures very much manifest in the very movements that we see in history So, uh, continuing, uh, long, long rant, but uh, necessary, I think. It's a, definitely a necessary elaboration.
uh, continuing with these transformations, species, elements, etc., is closely linked to the question of classification, equally important in the natural as in the social sciences. Linnaeus' system, 18th century, utilizing at its starting point the immutability of species, was limited to the description and classification of plants according to, the, to their external characteristics. The infantile period of botany is analogous to the infantile period of logic, since the forms of our thought developed like everything that lives. Only decisive repudiation of the idea of fixed species, only the study of the history of the evolution of plants and their anatomy, prepared the basis for a really scientific classification. Uh, which is um, a bit true, but not true, by the way. Uh, you know, we, we pretty much had good classifications for plants, animals, and human beings, and rational animals uh, far before we had any, like, genetic knowledge about evolution as well. Um, rather, one of the things interesting that uh, evolution, material evolution shows is that concepts do not have an overbearing uh, truth uh, or, you know, direction, such that, you know, uh, what Hegel would call a concept or a category, as he's calling it here, would be, you know, the definition of a sunflower, in which a sunflower is a specific definite concept, and it has its own life cycle, you know, its own ways of reproducing, its own specific structures of being, and slowly over time you get changes towards something that eventually is not a sunflower. But the transitions in between start breaking the concept. The transitions between no longer have, you know, a stable... could They could and they could not have a, a stable form themselves. Such that, you know... Um, you get breaks of concepts which don't disprove the concept. You know, you can have human beings which are gay. Uh, you know, they break the concept of the reproduction, the, the, necess the necessities of the reproduction of the species. So, you know, they go against what a human qua, you know, the necessities of the species of rep reproduction or as, as necessary for that are. So, you know, there's a defect, you could say. You know, the category is wrong, but it's not, you know, it, it doesn't make it... Uh, <laughs> an evil thing or bad, you know, it's just, uh, you know, if Helps. one really, if, yeah, if one really Helps wanted to be, yeah, <laughs> if one really wanted to be like a, this really, uh, what would you call it? What, uh, antinatalist? And a picky, ass, picky asshole or something. It says, well, oh. you know, that, you know, people who say like gays and transsexuals are defective. You oh, could yeah, legitimately yeah. say that on a formal basis and that like they, they literally go against the interests of the species as reproductive and expanding. You sure. Know? So you could say they're defective in that way, but uh, as a matter, for the most part, nature doesn't care, and nature, you know, just generates whatever nature can generate. You know, nature has no mm -hmm. limits on that. Yeah. But, you know, if everybody was gay, you bet your ass the species would die, especially if, mm -hmm. if they weren't willing to, you know, do what was necessary to reproduce the species. So if... But if everyone know, were straight and always reproducing then we wouldn't yeah you know, we would be, fucked. be in a worse situation <laughs> we would be fucked so you know we need Ready? we need those breaks from you know the natural drive so basically is yeah the, you know there are categories of fitness in which you know you are a fit human being you know somebody who's born and you know they're mentally deficient uh, they're not fully a human being somebody who's gay you could go ahead and said, if your definition of human being is, you know, the biological reproductive organism, yeah, they're defective in that way. If your definition is, you know, the cultural organism with intellect, no, they're perfectly human. So there's various ways you can categorize and things shift in and out and they don't always fully fit. You know, they're never like fully uh, reproductive. For example, uh, what is that mix between uh, a donkey and a horse? Is it a mule? Yeah. I think it's a mule. That, though it's possible, is not fit and is not itself a concept uh, as species because it literally is infertile. It cannot reproduce. So it can't oh, is even... That true? Oh. Yeah. Yeah, they're infertile. So this is why you, yeah. you can get certain mixes like tigons, ligers. Uh, I had a dream about ligers. Mo last night. Most of them are... Most The vast majority of them are incapable of reproducing. If they can reproduce, they yeah. produce some fucked up kids. And they have uh, Down so, syndrome. Yeah, and so that's when you get a point in nature in which nature could produce it, but it sure is fucked up and it shouldn't be. 
nature nature's own mechanisms you know work against it and say yeah we made this it ain't gonna work yeah, so it's that like you how can you say. Can have a peanut butter and uh i don't know uh a peanut butter hamburger or something but <laughs> do you really want it no yeah so you know in the grand scheme of things those things shouldn't exist because you know they they just can't exist of themselves you know they're contingent yeah. they, they don't exist on their own you know so they're not quite fit for any concept you know they don't really have a species concept but, but that was a really autistic rant <laughs> all right well, continuing i think it was Marx, who, in distinction from Darwin, was a conscious dialectician, discovered the basis for the scientific classification of human societies in the development of the productive forces and the structure of the relations of ownership, which constitute the anatomy of society. Marxism substituted for the vulgar descriptive classification of societies and states, which even up to now still flourish in the universities, materialistic dialectic classification. to determine both the concept of a worker state and the moment of its downfall. All this, as we see, contains nothing metaphysical or scholastic. <laughs> uh, no, and absolutely. This whole thing was mostly metaphysics and scholastic bullshit. From Trotsky's part. As conceited ignorance affirms, uh, once again, if you go and read about Trotsky, there can be no more conceited and ignorant guy than this guy. <laughs> yeah. Dialectic logic expresses the laws of motion in contemporary scientific thought. The struggle against materialist dialectics, on the contrary, expresses a distant past conservatism of the petit bourgeoisie, the self-conceit of university brutinist, and a spark of hope for an afterlife. Always got to connect metaphysics, uh, standard, you know, logic, and uh, uh, idealism and scholasticism as one thing, and just like give a couple of kicks. Even even when it really just doesn't fit. Uh, I mean, for the whole thing of you know, Marx prior to a scientific classification of human societies, um, not really. Uh, you know, the the distinction of the modes of production, relations of production, forces of production, it's well arbitrary. You can have certain forces of production which do not have certain relations of production, which do not have you know certain cultural relations, you know, cultural forms. Now, there's no there's no absolute necessary link. As a matter of fact, there's a huge, huge leeway between certain modes, certain forces of production, certain modes of production. Uh, what there is no huge leeway in is definitely in the relations of production, such that if you're going to have capitalist relations, you can't have slaves. Mostly because, guess what? The way your accumulation works is you got to sell to people. You, know, you you can't accumulate shit. If you can't produce a lot of shit to to do what? You know, slaves ain't going to buy shit. You know, you're barely giving them a subsistence of, you know, potatoes and rice, if anything, you know, good at that. Yeah, you know, they, they don't, they don't have, they're not buying clothes for fashions. You know, they don't have homes. They're not buying appliances. You know, you don't pay them. So it'd be stupid to have slaves if what you want to have is capitalist relations. But you can have factories run by slaves, you know, if, you know, it's just a factory for you. You know, maybe, maybe you really like, you know, strawberry jelly and you have a strawberry plantation. Yeah. And you have your slaves working and they work the factories and, you know, it produces a fucking life's worth of strawberry jelly in a couple of years. Well, great. <laughs> you can have that. There's, there's nothing stopping that you. Fun. Okay, what's your point with that? <laughs> I can't. Oh, the I point, is, the you... point is that you know that these classification of like the relations of production and the mo the modes of production is uh, is not a one way like absolute relation, oh, which sure. like one necessitates the other. If anything, I, mean, the... I didn't know what you meant by like a person wanting strawberry jelly. They can't I, sell I it to their know. workers or something. Well, yeah, you could be a slave who just you could be a slave master who just really loves strawberry jelly. Like you eat that shit all day long. Yeah, and all you want. Like, and so you know, jelly. so you know, you just have, have you have you know some little. guy invent for you, you know, or make for you that fucking factory. You know, you say, hey, you sure. know, I'll give you some strawberry jelly if you make that. And it's like, okay, you know, basic shit. They can it. Your, your slaves do it. You know, the rest of the time, you know, they take care of you, like Pharaoh or something. So you can have that. I mean, yeah. you don't you don't. 
there's certain levels in which like you know there is no contradiction yeah it's just optimal decadence though yeah yeah not everyone even wants that i don't know man there's not everyone people... is hedonism bought from that show <laughs> yeah futurama <laughs> yeah i remember you showed me that all right so here is i think um, this next section is the last section uh, we'll try to hurry it up uh is where i think uh Trotsky really shows what he's really getting at. Just like how Mao, you know, once he got to his, his examples, it really shows what he really was getting at. And what he really was getting at was a good point. But it wasn't the point he was making for most of the time. You know, the point he was really trying to get at was not some metaphysical laws of logic, not some really, you know, stringent way of thinking, but it's really about, you know, contextualism, about knowing how to look at the context of things, knowing how to look... Uh, and specifying, you know, what is important and what is not, and uh, using that to understand things. So, if uh, you could read that, Hyperion, my voice is getting tired. Yeah, I noticed you uh, have needed some water or something. Uh, the nature of the USSR, right? This is what you're talking about. Yeah. Okay. The definition of the USSR, given by Comrade Burnham, not a workers, but a bourgeois state is purely negative. Wrenched from the chain of historical development, left dangling in midair, void of a single particle of sociology, and represents simply a theoretical cap uh, capitulation of pragmatism before a contradictory historical phenomenon. If Burnham were a histor uh, sorry, a dialectical materialist, he would have probed the following three questions. One, what was the historical origin of the USSR? Two, what changes has this state suffered during its existence? Three, did these changes pass from the quantitative stage to the qualitative? That is, did they create a historically necessary domination by a new exploiting class? Answering these three questions would have forced Burnham to draw the only possible conclusion and the USSR is still a degenerated worker's state. Just to point out, I noticed that three distinct questions, each one yeah. itself and not another. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, so, uh, and each, you know, um, related to another, but, uh, you know, we could ask so many other questions, uh, which would not be in contradiction to any of these. And, uh, you know, yeah. what, whether we give them any importance, you know, how much importance it is. Uh, is another thing. This is, by the way, one of the ways, uh, like I was saying earlier, absolute having an absolute conception is something that dialect, Hegelian dialectics is about, such that you don't have this problem. You don't go and have these external questions, which are your subjective questions, which have you know your own interests and importance in them, uh, because this is actually not not dialectics. Uh, you know, it's it's good common sense. It can be very useful, but it's not an absolute answer and it's not an absolute logic okay uh moving on the dialectic is not a magic master key for all questions it does not replace concrete scientific analysis but it directs this analysis along the correct road securing it against sterile wanderings in the desert of subjectivism and scholasticism here here i think we can agree yeah. Okay. Bruno R. places both the Soviet and fascist regimes under the category of bureaucratic collectivism. Because the USSR, Italy, and Germany are all ruled by bureaucracies. Here and there are the principles of planning. In one case, private property is liquidated, in another, limited, etc. Thus, on the basis of the relative similarity of certain external characteristics of different origin, of different specific weight, of different class significance, a fundamental identity of social regimes is constructed, completely in the spirit of bourgeois professors who construct categories of controlled economy, centralized state, without taking into consideration whatsoever the class nature of one or the other. Bruno R. and his followers, or semi-followers like Burnham, 
at best remain in the sphere of social classification on the levels of Linnaeus, who, in, in whose justification it should be remarked, however, that he lived before Hegel, Darwin, or Marx. So, right, any, um, uh, basically there we can see horseshoe theory has been around for a long time, guys. Uh, it, it's been a thorn in everybody's side for a long, long time. And by the way, one of the things to point out is it's not wrong to make these comparisons of identity. It's like, you know, authoritarian states are authoritarian states, whether it's a Nazi state or a communist state or a liberal state. Quote unquote liberal. <laughs> Generated worker state. The pro the problem is, of course, that things, these uh, you know these identities, are just abstract identities. Uh, you know the reality is each is an individual, and has differences, and you know it's uh, you know if, sure violence is violence, but there's obviously a big difference between the violence of the poor, and the violence of the rich, the violence of the powerful and the violence of the weak, the oppressed. So you know. That's the problem with that, you know, it's not specific enough, you know, and the reason it stays at such an abstraction is because they know that if they went to the specifics, they would have to fold and say, you know, one is different from the other, one is better than another, they're not qualitatively equal at all. You know, because uh, all, only the, the most politically suicidal nowadays would come out and openly say that the violence of the powerful against the, the mad, the few and powerful against the many and oppressed is morally equal to the violence of the many and oppressed against the few and powerful. You know, uh, even, even sure. Republicans in the modern day can't say that. You know, uh, every, nobody ever wants to hold themselves to be the powerful and few and put themselves in that position. You know, you're seen as kicking down. You know, there is a moral superiority and validity to the violence of the weak against the strong who oppress them. Sure. So anyways, yeah. Uh, if, if they got to concrete, uh, to the concrete forms, you know, in school, in which, like, actually describing, you know, the details of uh, the difference of the authoritarian states, uh, no one could ever say, like, oh, yeah, you know, Stalin was just as bad as Hitler. Not even close or Mao, or, you know, Che, or uh, Fidel Castro, or Hugo Chavez, or whatever. You know, it's, it's just not the same. Yeah, it's abstract to say that. To it's not the same. Them, yeah, it's not the same, and uh, one of them is more justified than the other. Yeah. Go on. Okay. Uh, even worse and more dangerous, perhaps, are those eclectics who express the idea that the class character of the Soviet state, quote, does not matter, end quote, and that the direction of our policy is determined by the, quote, character of the war, end quote, as if the war were an independent super, super social substance, as if the character of the war were not determined by the character of the ruling class, that is, by the same social factor that also determines the character of the state. Astonishing how easily some comrades forget the ABCs of Marxism under the blows of events. Uh, so, I mean, uh, okay. I don't know. I guess, I guess we could talk, like, mention here, like, something like Mao. Mao would disagree, because Mao is like, fuck it, man. We'll ally with anybody. <laughs> like, you know, we'll ally yeah. with the peasants, we'll ally with the national bourgeoisie, we'll beat the imperialists, and then we'll fucking kick their ass. Yeah. He even tried to ally with Stalin. He even tried to ally with Stalin, but, you know, Stalin ignored him. <laughs> Didn't I want still to. Don't, I still need I to, like, read it, up yeah. what the fuck their problem was. What's going on? Yeah, he he seemingly ignored him for three days when he was in Moscow. Okay. Yeah. It is not surprising that the theoreticians of the opposition who reject dialectic thought uh, capitulate lamentably before the contradictory nature of the USSR. 
However, the contradiction between the social basis laid down by the revolution and the character of the caste, in, as in caste system, uh, which, rose out of, uh, which arose out of the degeneration of the revolution, is not only an irrefutable historical fact, but also a motor force. In our struggle for the overthrow of the bureaucracy, we base ourselves on this contradiction. Meanwhile, some ultra-lefts have already reached the ultimate absurdity by affirming that it is necessary to sacrifice the social structure of the USSR in order to overthrow the Bonapartist oligarchy. They have no suspicion that the USSR, minus the social structure founded by the October Revolution, would be a fascist regime. <laughs> Do you agree with him there? I'm not quite sure what the hell he's saying. Oh, he's saying uh, if we didn't have this oligarchy of uh, in the USSR, if we remove these people, it would become fascist. Oh yeah, they would have been bowled over by Germany well, yeah. without it. Yeah, this was 1939, right? Yeah. A year before his death. Yeah. Definitely true. I mean, though, I, I, you know, again, he, um, so you can see that uh, contradiction here is the contradiction, nat the contradiction nat nature of USSR. It's like Mao. Mao's contradiction is opposition, uh, conflict opposition. And so this is uh, this is a common misunderstanding by Marxists, uh, clearly. Um, but again, I mean, like this is picking and choosing which which contradictions, uh, you know, you think are primary. It's like you know, primary and secondary contradictions, which are the most important and which are not. You know, uh, left comms will say, look, the most important contradiction is we got to get rid of the value form. You know number one you know after that uh, you know other ones would be you know for obviously trotsky would be the most important contradiction is you know we got to save socialism somehow you know we got to accelerate the forces of production we got to you know accelerate the consciousness blah 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 but there's a whole bunch of contradictions going on and people were always uh insofar as there were problems and there are conflicts of interest uh, you know, there are contradictions of, of this kind. So, you know, people's unhappiness with the authoritarian character of the regime obviously would cause contradictions. People would infiltrate the party, you know, with the idea of changing these conditions, you know, probably opening them up, being a bit more liberal in that sense. Uh, people like Khrushchev, you said, you know, didn't like the planned economy, you know, wanted to, quote-unquote, liberalize the economy and to bring in free markets uh, for the sake of, you know, a brighter... Uh, more productive future, blah, blah, blah. So um, a lot of things were going on, a lot of contradictions of that sort. Okay, should we read the last part? Yeah. All right. Evolution and dialectics. Comrade Burnham will probably protest that as an evolutionist, he is interested in the development of society and state forms not less than, or no less, it's a typo, than we dialecticians. We will not dispute this. Every educated person since Darwin has labeled themselves an evolutionist. But a real evolutionist must apply the idea of evolution to his own forms of thinking. Evolutionary, sorry, elementary logic founded in the period when, an, when the idea of evolution itself did not yet exist, is evidently insufficient for the analysis of evolutionary processes. Hegel's logic is the logic of evolution. Only one must not forget that the concept of evolution itself has been completely corrupted and emasculated by university and liberal writers to mean peaceful, quote-unquote, progress. Whoever has come to understand that evolution process through the struggle of antagonistic forces, that a slow accumulation of changes at a certain moment explodes the old shell and brings about a catastrophe, revolution, whoever has learned finally to apply the general laws of evolution to thinking itself, he is a dialectician, as distinguished from vulgar evolutionists. Dialectic training of the mind 
as necessary to a revolutionary fighter as finger exercises to a, a pianist. Demands approaching all problems as processes and not as motionless categories. Whereas vulgar evolutionists who limit themselves generally to recognizing evolution in only certain spheres content themselves in all other questions with the banalities of quote-unquote common sense. So, um, I think that final point is itself banal. And, uh, <laughs> I mean, it, it's it's just going from his, his misunderstanding of what he's saying. I mean, most of this, including this last point, really has nothing to do with Hegelian logic. Yeah. Um, the point about evolution is, you know, not understanding of, you know, processes is is weird because uh, you know where we got this fucking social Darwinist from? <laughs> the very people who thought that evolution was nothing but the dog eat dog, dog world of conflict. You know, it wasn't a peaceful thing. You know, these ideas got exactly from Darwin, the idea that it's the, you know, survival of the fittest. You know, what were these people? The eugenicists. You know, the people say the, the very people nowadays are the phrenologists and like the like people who focus on IQ. And said, so, you know, we need to get to rid of the stupid and the autistic. We need to get rid of black people. Yeah, they're based on this sort of evolutionist logic. And it's yeah. not the logic of unchanging categories. It's the logic of the supremacy of conflict. Yeah. Accelerated conflict. So, you know, he says, elementary logic founded in the period when the idea of evolution itself did not exist is evidently insufficient for the analysis of evolutionary processes. Uh, no, it's quite fine for it. Um, the only reason it isn't fine is because from within it, there, there's a huge debate that just goes on and off every once in a while about is there purpose or is there not? You know, are we right to talk about purpose or are we not? You know, Kant himself even had this issue. He's like, it seems so obvious that there are purposes in life, that life has a purpose, you know, at least as life. But there's no material way to actually talk about this. It, it just doesn't make sense. Yeah, you, because from New Newtonian physics or even Einsteinian physics or modern physics, quantum physics, there's no ground. There's no ground in, in physics or chemistry to talk about a purpose of life. And yet life seems to obviously have a purpose. You know, without purpose, you really can't talk about evolution because evolution has to be a evolution towards something. It can't just be change. Otherwise, we just call it change. You know, things evolve towards certain things, and it's very obvious that life has evolved towards certain things. So, you know, one of the things that's absolutely key is you need to have the concept of purpose. Even if you can't, even if you're not willing to like, explicitly accept it, you must use it. But you can use this analytically, you know, no problem. Once you have it, you can speak of evolution towards things. I mean, like, what is it that the, the bourgeois economists did? You know, they were saying we evolved towards capitalism. Why? Because it was our natural desire and drive, you know. You know, yeah. Before, we just didn't have, you know, the, the elements which allowed us to be, you know, to live our individual necessities, but now we do. So now we, you know, so it's it exists now, even though it was there from the beginning. So, you know, they, they posit capitalism as the consequence of selfish individualism, Yeah. you know, which has always been essential in the human nature. And, you know, that's been the driving force. You know, it's been the purpose, you know, yeah. why does and capitalism... Yeah, so why does capitalism exist? Is because of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what yeah. they say. So yeah. they, so that's what they say. So actually, they do use an evolutionary's uh, perspective. You know, it's a, at least in standard terms, it's valid. You know, plenty of people will accept that unquestionably, even though you know, if you look back in history, it just doesn't. It doesn't really make much sense, but whatever. You know, so uh, his attack on formal logic was just uh, ultimately empty. I mean. Uh, None of what he says can't not be done by formal logic. It can totally be done. And uh, none of what he did uh, really was dialectical. Um, I mean, the best I can say is that if you under, if you could do dialectical logic, if you, were, if you understood it and you were good at it, um, it would help you do this kind of thing a lot better, in which you would be a lot, you would have a lot in easier, of an easier time noticing these unified processes, you know, these cycles in which they generate themselves like life. Because that kind of the, the way Hegelian processes work, they're life, they're life cycles, you know. You take the sunflower, it grows, you know, the seed, it grows, it has leaves, it has a certain structure, it grows the flower, makes the seed, grows again. You know, 
that's a concept, that's a process, that's the kind of process that capitalism is. Capitalism begins what? With commodities, ends with what? Commodities. In between, what does it do? Buys and sells commodities, produces commodities, consumes commodities. But it begins and it ends with commodities. You know, it's a, it's a, it's like a living organism. So when you 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 know how to do that, uh, you start looking at things in that way, and you start being able to piece things in this way. Uh, but most things, by the way, don't fit to this because most things really aren't of this sort. Uh, most things don't really have a self-perpetuating life cycle of this kind. So you know you 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 can put things together to a certain extent. But eventually, you know, it actually ends up being yeah, actually subjective. It, it, it ends up being arbitrary because things only exist for a certain amount of time because we deem them to exist and that's it, you know. N nothing necessary about them, either metaphysical terms or material terms or cultural terms. It's just a fad. You know, it's a, the only way to explain it is uh, the very things he was talking about earlier, you know, context, you know, material context of the time, the kind of ideas of the time, but there was nothing essential about the thing itself. You know, it was just contingent. It was by chance. You know, the elements aligned, and we had the stupid cities in the U.S. which were built around cars. But you know, 50 years from now, won't be. But all right, uh, that was Leon Trotsky's "The ABC of Materialist Dialectics." Uh, yeah, I this hope was actually you... my first time <laughs> reading directly the. Ice pick receiver. So, <laughs> well, okay. I've read his introduction for my edition of the Communist Manifesto, but that was just like a celebration of the coming centennial, like in 10 years after he wrote it. But yeah, this yeah, didn't so... really impress me at all. Uh, there wasn't really anything I didn't know or anything that I really thought was like something that no one really knows. And... Yeah, I mean, uh, just like Mao, a lot of. Overdressed, overdressed in, in unnecessary jargon and unnecessary examples, which had nothing to do with the ultimate point, really. Yeah. You know, it, it could have really just been summarized in that last two sections. The first section was wholly unnecessary at all. He, he just completely abandons the point in, in the end anyways. And so, yeah, uh, if you hadn't read this, well, now you heard it here. Uh, don't ever recommend this. Yeah, Stop breaking me on uh, saying I don't understand dialectics and saying to read Trotsky. Oh yeah, dude. Like I, people have <laughs> yeah, recommended you can't say this. It, I have. Yeah, somebody, yeah, I somebody on Reddit the other day, literally, like I, somebody posted my thing on Mao, and, and like one of the first responses, like, has this guy read the ABCs of materialist dialectics? And he fucking liked it. And I'm like, oh my god. But anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, I hope you learned something. Uh, see you next time.